Hello, and welcome to the Coherence Screencast series. My name is Jason Howes, and I'm a team lead on the Oracle Coherence product. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of the new REST API for Coherence. I'm going to start off with a simple high-level overview of REST, what it is and how it is used. Next, I will go over the features of the new Coherence REST API and finish up with a description of how it is configured and deployed. So what exactly is REST? REST is an acronym that stands for Representational State Transfer, and it is commonly used with two meanings, a pure meaning and a real-world meaning. First and foremost, REST is an architectural style for designing networked applications. Like other styles, such as client-server and distributed objects, REST consists of a set of high-level abstract patterns and constraints that express the core principles behind the architectural approach. Additionally, REST is a simple, lightweight alternative to other styles, such as web services, CORBA, and RMI. While simple, REST is fully featured in that you can use it to design systems that are just as capable as those designed using other styles. Furthermore, REST shares many of the benefits of web services. It is platform and language independent and firewall friendly, which is essential for building applications for the web. REST consists of several important components. First of all, REST is inherently client-server. Additionally, clients communicate with servers using a stateless protocol. In other words, no state is retained by the server across client requests. The stateless nature of REST has many benefits, including reliability in the face of partial network failures and making a system easily scalable. The second major component of REST is the concept of a resource. A resource represents either state or functionality and is referenced with a unique global URI. In order to manipulate resources, a client uses a standardized interface to exchange representations of resources with one or more servers. Note that the resources themselves are conceptually separate from the representations returned to the client. Resources may link to other resources using their URIs. Additionally, since a resource is uniquely identified by its URI, its representation can be easily cached by clients. The last major component of REST are verbs, which are a set of actions that may be performed on a resource. For example, a client may wish to read, create, update, or delete a resource. Chances are when you hear people talking about REST, they are most likely referring to the real-world incarnation of the REST architectural style. In this form, clients and servers use HTTP to exchange resource representations. As I mentioned before, REST is both platform and language independent, so there are a wide variety of clients, including applications written in C++, Java, .NET, and web pages that include JavaScript. Likewise, there are a wide variety of servers, including HTTP servers like Apache, and J2EE web containers such as Glassfish and WLS. Resources are identified by HTTP URLs and are typically represented by JSON or XML documents. Finally, resources are manipulated using the standard HTTP verbs delete, get, post, and put. REST is becoming an increasingly popular architecture for exposing state and functionality on the web. For example, many large web services today are exposed via REST APIs, including Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, and Amazon S3 and EC2, a trend that will most likely continue at an accelerated pace. Now that I've given you background about REST, I'm going to dive into the new Coherence REST API. Coherence 371 includes a REST API, which allows non-clustered clients to access and manipulate data stored in clustered Coherence caches. For those of you familiar with Coherence, this description may sound similar to that of Coherence Extend. In fact, you can think of the REST API as a new flavor of Coherence Extend one that replaces the proprietary binary TCP IP protocol used between clients and proxies with vanilla HTTP. Additionally, instead of using Java or POF serialization to serialize data objects, the REST API marshals data objects to and from JSON or XML. Finally, the REST API supports all the client languages of Coherence Extend and more. The simplest set of operations supported by the REST API are those that access or manipulate a single cache entry. The URLs for these operations consist of the name of the coherence cache that contains the target entry, followed by the string representation of the entry's key. 
For example, the URL at the top of this slide would refer to the entry in the context cache with key Emily Harris. To access a cached object, a client performs an HTTP GET of its corresponding URL. This operation returns either the JSON or XML representation of the object, or an HTTP 404 status if no such mapping exists or if the caller is unauthorized to access the resource. Likewise, to create or update a cached object, a client performs an HTTP PUT of its corresponding URL. In this case, the request body must include the JSON or XML representation of the object. The server will return a 403 status if the caller is unauthorized, or a 409 status and the current object if a concurrency check fails. I will talk a bit more about concurrency control in a later slide. Finally, to delete a cached object, a client performs an HTTP delete of its corresponding URL. Like GET, the server will return a 404 status if no such mapping exists, or if the caller is unauthorized to access the resource. In addition to single entry operations, the Coherence REST API includes support for bulk operations that access or delete multiple entries at once. The URLs for these operations are similar to those for single entry operations, but include one or more keys within parentheses, with each key separated by a comma. To access multiple cached objects, a client performs an HTTP GET of the URL which will return the set of requested objects in JSON or XML form. Keep in mind that the ordering of the returned objects is undefined and that missing objects will be silently removed from the results. If you must be able to determine the order of returned resources, you can include additional information in the resource representation to identify the corresponding key. To delete multiple cached objects, a client performs an HTTP delete of the URL. This operation will always return an HTTP 200 status even if no such mapping exists or if the caller is unauthorized to delete one or more of the specified objects. The Coherence REST API also allows you to query caches for objects that match a filter or pattern. The simplest form of such a URL consists of the name of the cache to query, followed by a URL encoded COHQL expression. However, more complex requests can be made that include sort order and a subset of results to return. The Coherence REST API even allows you to leverage the data grid features of Coherence to perform complex aggregation and parallel processing. In its simplest form, an aggregation request is identified by a URL consisting of the name of the target cache, followed by an aggregator name and optional parameters. More complex requests can restrict the aggregation to a subset of cache entries by specifying a query or set of keys in the URL. You can use any of the aggregators included with Coherence or any other custom aggregator that you may develop. You can also perform parallel processing of cache data with the REST API. A basic processing request is identified by a URL consisting of the name of the target cache followed by a processor name and optional parameters. As is the case with aggregations, more complex requests can restrict the processing to a subset of cache entries, and you can use any of the processors included with Coherence or any custom processor. Often an application requires only a subset of a cached object's properties. In this case, it makes no sense to return all of the object properties to a client, only to have the client ignore some of them. The REST API allows you to optimize these use cases by returning a partial object, which consists of only the properties of an object that you're interested in. To take advantage of this feature, simply pass the list of properties you're interested in via a P parameter to any of the aforementioned read requests. As I mentioned earlier, the REST API supports marshalling data objects to and from JSON and XML representations using either JAXB or Jackson. If you'd like to use another JSON or XML marshalling library, or if you'd like to use a different data representation altogether, you can do so by either implementing the marshaller interface or by extending the abstract marshaller base class. The last major feature of the Coherence REST API is optimistic concurrency control for mutating operations. If your data objects in the representations carry version information, the REST API will compare the included version number against the one contained in the current cached object. If the versions match, the operation will complete as normal. If the versions are different, the REST API will return a 409 to indicate the conflict. 
Now that I've given you an overview of the new Coherence REST API features, I'd like to briefly talk about how you configure it. Configuration information for the REST API is contained in two XML configuration files. The first file is named Coherence REST Config, and it contains definitions of the resources you'd like to expose via REST. For each resource, you must specify the name of the containing cache and the Java class name of the key and value classes. Additionally, for key classes that can't automatically be converted to and from a string representation, you must implement and register a key converter that performs this conversion. Finally, if you're using a custom Marshaller implementation, you must register it using its Java class name. Likewise, if your application uses custom aggregators and or processors, you must register them using their Java class names. By default, Coherence looks for the Coherence REST config file in both the class path and working directory. However, you can also specify the location of your file using the Tangasol Coherence REST config system property override. The second configuration file used by the REST API is called Coherence REST POF config. This file contains the registration of POF user types used internally by the REST API. If you're using POF serialization, you must include this file in your POF config file. Additionally, don't forget to also include Coherence POF config. Now that you know how to configure the Coherence REST API, I will conclude this screencast with information on how to deploy it. There are two basic ways to deploy the Coherence REST API. The first consists of running an embedded HTTP server in a proxy server JVM. This option is great for simple production deployments or for testing during development. To use this deployment option, simply start a proxy server that uses a cache configuration file with an HTTP acceptor configuration element under its proxy scheme element. Here you can specify the HTTP listen address and port, along with the type of embedded HTTP server to use. Coherence include integration with Grizzly and Sun's lightweight HTTP server out of the box, but custom integrations can be created by implementing the HTTP server interface. The second deployment option consists of deploying the Jersey Servlet Dispatcher to a full-fledged J2EE servlet container, such as Jetty, Glassfish, or WLS. This approach is good for complex production deployments where additional J2EE services, such as security, are required. Regardless of the approach you choose, be sure to disable distributed cache data storage in your proxy server or web container JVM. This concludes my presentation of the new Coherence REST API. Here are a few links for more information on Coherence 371. Thanks for watching the Coherence screencast series.